every single bit of the organization has its own way of doing things. And in doing so, it allows for a lot of chaos in a lot of ways, but a lot of creativity at the same time. And they're working towards streamlining it, but as it is right now, it's fairly diverse. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure what you guys want to know, but I'm just going to leave it up to the questions. Do you have anything you really want to ask off the top? Or? Yeah. Um, what kind of stack are you working on? So primarily, I do a lot of Python. I do a lot of Java. And I do AWS, Google Cloud Platform, Azure. And we do our own in-house Nutanix base. So Nutanix is a storage solution, but by creating a storage solution, you can create your own VMs there in both Linux and Mac based, uh, I mean in Linux and Windows based uh, systems, and you can build the orchestration from there. And it's easier on because it's on, on site, so you can update and do a lot more stuff there. Uh, any damage? What do you guys want to know? <clears throat> uh, yeah, what's it like working for Nike? This is great. I came to the last month, worked on anywhere. I wear sneakers every day. I primarily wear sweatpants to work if I go to work. Uh, it's, they're very flexible and they're good at keeping it mobile. So there's a lot of that going on, and I really enjoy that feature of it. And it pays well. So, you know, here's that. I mean, it's Friday, and I just rolled out of bed, and I'm here to have this conversation with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and you get paid. Yeah. Um, yes. Damn. Every two weeks. <laughs> that's, that is how it works. Go Nike. So what does a typical day consist of for you? So my typical day is not very typical. So because we built our own platform and we don't really worry, worry about what the test like the test end of it, it would be these are there'd be new projects I have to build, new things I have to like iterate on, and I have to go through those and figure out what needs to be done. Then I have to check in with the people that we're doing the actual release or updating the software and find out from them if there's anything that they saw overnight or that they saw in the last 24 hours that need to be updated. If something critical pops up, then I have to fix that right away and devote all my time there. But generally, it's a lot of like maintaining code bases and like building new and like creative ways to do things we've already done. So it's a lot of, hey, we heard that this new technology is coming out that does uh, AWS backend that in like way better than you currently do it. Uh, we use Ansible. Why not use? But why not use uh, Terraform instead, or use Kubernetes instead? And it'd be a lot of testing for that environment and trying to find out how to upgrade it, but also at the same time, maintaining what I already have. Does that make sense? OK. Uh, any other questions? Uh, what do you think your skill level was at in terms of programming when you actually started working for Nike? So when I started working for Nike, I'd say my skill level was fairly front end. I mean, I had a a lot of like understanding of how to build like an AWS environment because I taught myself uh, through the AWS like developer course and a little bit of the architect course, but I didn't take the tests on it. And I, I didn't have any real replication of it. Most of my stuff was I started out like I'd go to a bar and I'd meet the bar owner and be like, "You guys don't have a website? Like, how about I'll build this website for you and you give me a couple hundred bucks in bar credit? You don't lose anything." I get a couple free beers. You got a website that I can put in like my resume, and from there I just helped like build a base and had enough clients that could prove that I knew what I was doing, and I used that information to leverage moving on to something else. Uh, so, what was that that transition where you were working on front end and you realized like, oh, I want to go for like DevOps or I want to move into service side stuff? Okay. So, I mean, you guys probably realize this already. Like, the front end market is saturated. There's so many people who are doing, you know, just HTML, CSS stuff and just getting by on that. And there's so many ways for you to do it without having a developer. There are a lot of, like, content management systems that you could use to, like, launch that information. So, <coughs> you need to have, a, like, a, a broader understanding of how, like, not just, like, uh, programming works, but how, like, a computer orchestration works. I like started teaching myself that, and from there it went to how does networking work? Why, when you send a packet from one computer to the next, like how what does that interaction mean? And then learning that, and then figuring out how that works on a global scale. Like how does AWS do that? How does Google Cloud Platform do that? And then taking that information and just like googling it, you know, just like looking into it and finding out more. Do you spend a lot of time in Google? Yeah, it's. <laughs> Legitimately, my best friend. I'm pretty sure I would be fired without it. <laughs> it's so the, the the thing about like 
DevOps in general is that a lot of the problems are cloud orchestration, right? So you have to understand how that works. But a lot of it is sort of the Wild West in the way it's run. I mean, short of AWS crushing things because they've got it all like dialed into a click and play situation, Azure, on the other hand, not as great in a lot of ways. And you know, there's like every little system has its own hiccups. And when you run into that hiccup, what do you do? You can't just quit. You have to learn and adapt and figure out a new way to get there. And a lot of that is, you know, self-motivated. And the same thing with you guys. I mean, you could easily just go to your code school class or go to like take your like beginner job and just keep doing that and never learn anything. But if you don't push yourself, you'll never progress. So you know. And uh, as far as that, and the thing that I think you guys should probably take away from this is the importance of getting yourselves a mentor, like someone you know in your field or in the field that you want to be that has a place that you want to be at, and meeting with them and finding out more about how they got there and just having them check in with you. I think they'd still do those Saturday meetups, right? Where it's like Saturday mentorships. Uh, which one? There, there's one, I know. Uh, yeah, there's like Pearl. Yeah, right. I, I've been to that, I used to go to that and that was super helpful phase, for a while. Phase two, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just like, it's, or you can, you know, go on Reddit, meet someone there, ask some questions, but the idea is the best way to learn is by creating a community around it. Like you are not an island. You know, you can't just imagine all these like job opportunities to come to you, especially in Portland where it's just like a network city. Almost every other position I've ever met or known anyone that works out here is because, oh, I was at coffee and I met someone. I was like hanging out at a bar and I met someone. Or, you know, I went to a meetup and I met people. And everyone's gonna tell you to push networking, but really that's it. Just do things that, you know, you're usually gonna do find people that you like, that do the things you already do, like have them help you. Yeah. When you were talking about like your job is like making the app experience between like North America and South America like similar, like what are, what are some of the complications that might be different in South America? So uh, depending, like uh, South America might be a great like, example. Let's go with Asia, right? Uh, they only, for a long time, used uh, Azure, and like AWS was most widely used there. So you had to figure out a way to communicate between whatever else is building something in AWS and something in Azure, and how to transfer that information from one to the other. And the way to like like make it accessible for your data to be globally reachable. Uh, so it'd be something like you built uh, you built something locally, right? Like here in Portland and you want it to be able to get there, how do you clone that VM, make sure the data is being passed and sent the process? So you use something like Jenkins, which would execute and pass your data where you need to be. Right, Tim? Yeah, so, so you're dealing with a lot of like containers and like yeah. cross platform, cross network type of compatibility issues. That is exactly it. Yeah, uh, so it's, a lot of containerization and understanding how the network, how networks are set up, and getting information safely from one network to another. Hey. It's sort of a catch-all term for uh, like the continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline. And it's just a way of making sure that every sort, like the old method of like updating like an app, for example, right, would just be you build it, you push it, you hope it works, and then you do the same thing over and over again instead of like doing it in parcels. So you'd be continuously updating and developing, and you'd be continuously changing like small portions of what you're doing and releasing new <coughs> releases come behind it that only fix like new like issues that they come up. And that is like kind of the base of what DevOps would be. And I mean, so it's more than just being a developer where you get like a piece of code and you're working on that. It's also the orchestration of how would you get that information out to whatever server you're trying to push it to and make sure that it's updatable and you can test it and that it's constantly available when you need to be. So, so DevOps and site reliability engineer, what's the difference? To, 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 I've seen a lot of those job descriptions. Mm -hmm. So I honestly don't know, right? Because it's 
It, no, because it's like this concept where like DevOps and site reliability are used so interchangeably sometimes, and it depends on who you're asking that they might be the same thing or they might be two completely different fields, right? Uh, it is the same concept, just making sure that they, they, they do almost essentially the same thing. And I know people who do the, the same job and all they did was transfer from one to the other, while site reliability is more about standing at website, maintaining that, maintaining code on there, and then doing continuous updates and rolling updates without having anything go down. While DevOps will sort of do the same thing, but depending on where your iteration is, it can, it's very different. Does that make sense? Or answer your question? Yeah, it's still a little bit gray, but I mean, it sounds like it's gray anyway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah so. that's it, right? It's yeah. it's not like any, the, the thing that's so strange about it is the whole field did not exist like, you know, like 10, 15 years ago. It's like fairly brand new. And it's just the idea that we you want to be able to continuously update things because as the internet grew, the demand for your site to never go down increased, and that's where these positions came from. Who's the stakeholders you're involved with then within the company? So, like example developers, that I would assume would be a stakeholder mm -hmm. as well. Who else is in the kind of the, the group? There's a lot. I mean, so it's our uh, we have a lot of data scientists that will like do the data migration stuff, and we'll have like application engineers who will sort of do it. But our primary goal is made is just the pipeline to make sure that like you get from point A to point B and the releases are updated. There are different levels of like what you consider DevOps because there's someone whose job would be to make sure that the code is up to speed and checking it and like continuously updated where it needs to be. But mine is just to make sure the framework is established. Any mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what like community or resources did you plug into for your requirements? Oh yeah. Uh, I like just went to uh, Palos and bought a bunch of books on Python, and that was like the my my second language after JavaScript because JavaScript was fairly intuitive, and Python was easier. Uh, I did a lot of that, and from Python I went and I just, honestly just googled a bunch of stuff. I can't tell you where I got the information from specifically, but it was just realizing that. Where I wasn't where I wanted to be required a lot of work, and I had to focus to get there, and I <clears throat> like grinded to get my point across. Yeah. So it sounds like Python is what you use for the pipeline to connect everything up. So Python is mostly the code base behind it, but we use a lot of Ansible, and Ansible is a playbook orchestration uh, for auto. It's an automation. Uh, language, it's fairly simply written, and you can write plays inside of that that use Python in the back end, or you can use YAML scripts if you need to, to help facilitate uh, automation in different locations. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it's mainly what, you're, or a lot of what you're doing then is creating automation yeah. to get everything. Yeah, it is. And it's also network, network troubleshooting and network creation in the sense that we're not the networking team, but we are the ones to ensure that like, if a network goes down in our pipeline, to fix it and to create new subnets or things of that nature. So when you're working with um, uh, AWS, mm -hmm. Azure, um, what are the overlaps? I guess you, know, you were saying that you, you have to solve a problem, you know, maybe South America using Azure and then elsewhere AWS. Can you give an example? You know, without it being uh, an NDA situation. <laughs> where that's, you're, to be honest, that's the biggest problem is how do I... Uh, you know, from a high level, what was the problem that needed to be solved on both? I guess is the, the question. Uh, it'd be more something along the lines of a, a server going down because of an outage that's local to an area that you're in, right? How do you make sure that your network is dynamic enough that one if one goes down, no one actually sees that loss. So you'd have to make sure it's like uh, expanded enough that it has different locations for it to get to, but at the same time, uh, it has like a general storage of like a volume mounted somewhere that you can constantly like get your information from. And in order to create that network, you would use the DevOps, the developer side to create that, and the operations side to make sure it all connects together. Yeah. <clears throat> you guys have any other questions? So it sounds like you kind of learned JavaScript first, and then you maybe... Then Python would be the next big one. So, wait, 
did you like what made you decide to learn Python? Was it just like you were like, oh, the market's so flooded with front end like JavaScripts, like not very useful in the yeah, that's pretty sense. much it. Plus, it's also with JavaScript. I mean, unless you're doing React and React Native programming, uh, it's not as it wasn't already you know, like it, in a lot of different companies. A lot of them want someone who knows like a back end developer. So that's someone who's like you Python or C sharp, like a larger language that's more robust than JavaScript is on its own, based on like their uh, inherited programming they've been using forever. And just like Googling, I like looked at like job applications, things that were out there, and a lot of them were out there who had like Python experience, who had C sharp experience, who had Java experience, and those were like a little more robust languages to learn. So I picked one, thought Python was fairly accessible, and went with it. So, like in your in like the current time here, how much do you feel like you're looking up new things and learning new? Uh, so the team that I work on is fairly unique, right? So we do what's called a two-week sprint where we spend two weeks building and creating uh, whatever our problems are for that time. So we'll go from, let's say, you know, Monday of this week to Friday of the next, and that's all dev time. We have to like build or solve problems that are supposed to be done. And then every third iteration of that, so every six weeks, we'll get like a two-week sprint where we can just like do innovation, learn things we want to do, explain new things, and try to build on Either what we already have or some cool thing we found on the internet somewhere that we wanted to learn more about. And because of that, I'm like able to learn a lot more than I would almost anywhere else while just like grinding out constantly. Okay. <clears throat> Did it take you a long time to learn the networking aspect? Uh, so uh, I want to say no, but I honestly don't think I know networking. Right, like I mean, I know enough that if stuff goes bad, I can fix it. But I am nowhere near like a network admin or to that level of skill where you need to be like, yeah, I know networking. I can build this thing inside and out. I know which switches to like are connected to which and which ones to do and what commands to type or where to find my DNS. I can do some of that, but it's I would never say like I know networking. It's it's one of the tools I I possess, but not like a forte. Like most of me in this room, probably I am from a very strong dev background. That's like where I started. It's what I learned. It's what I like doing. I like solving problems. And with my current team and working what I do now, it's mainly taking that concept, and expanding upon it. Right? A new problem exists. How do you find? Like, how do you solve that? How do you fix it? Break down those components. Uh, you start at the micro level first, whether it's a switch not being turned on, or a VM being down, or a like a connection being blocked, you're getting a 4 4 error, and then go larger and then figure out where is it just at that level and keep continuously growing out until you find that. It's the same concept of if you were like building a program and something wasn't working, you figure out it's because you missed you mislinted something, right? Like you it's that same like drive to want to solve a problem, just expand it in a different direction. Yeah. You use AWS exclusively for the most part? Uh no, I do not. So it's AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud Platform. Those are the three that I use almost every day. Like the big three. Yeah. 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 That's, that's really, like, honestly, I got super lucky in like, that internship because there was a point where we had this giant project that was needed, that needed to get done. And it was to facilitate the, like, a large release that was going to come out of like, a shoe, right? And we wanted to be able to find that information, test it, and get things done. And in order to do that, I had to learn every single part of the architecture and every like interface that I would have to touch to make it work. And I spent, I don't know, like 12 hour days, like five days a week and would still be home on the weekend solving the exact same problem and waking up and like slacking like my mentor from my inside my team being like, hey, what do you think about this? Do you think it's a good idea? And he was like, go to bed. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you do not get paid that much for overtime, right? Yeah. So. It's because of that I like, was forced to learn more than I probably would of on my own. So it sounds like as DevOps, it's kind of a twenty-four-seven job, meaning somebody's always got to be okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, 
in so yeah, in theory, eight is twenty four seven job, right? So you want to they, there's this concept of the nines and how many nines you can have, right? So it's like how often is your system up and how often is your uh, and you want to get out to like five nines or six nines as far as like how long your system can potentially go without ever needing to ever go down. And in order for that to happen, you need to have someone working, you know, in different locations. Luckily, Nike's a large enough company that we have an offsite. So when we're go when we go home at five, there's someone who starts at that time in I don't know India or like Europe, and that's how they keep that cycle going. So in other words, your position then you don't have to be like, okay, you're going to be working Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, actually, was whole week you're going to be working. <laughs> so that is just me, but just like me and the team I'm on. I have friends like I have a friend who works at Akamai. He has the exact same sort of DevOps thing. He used to work on my current team, but now he works there, and he's on a five-week rotation, like, uh, I think it's like four weeks on, uh, one week off, and that's how it goes. And he's on 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. of, like, potentially being on call for, that, like, that five days a week or six days a week. And generally, nothing happens, but if something happens, it's his job to figure out what it is and escalate it. How many people are in your group? It's small. It, yeah, it started out with eight, now we're down to three, and three people just know enough. That's, it was, it's like a really strenuous job of like, you're always getting asked as soon as we knew, you're always being given some like new tasks that need to get done, and it's super challenging, but it's very rewarding. Are all your titles DevOps in that group, manager, or? I have a uh, manager, a lead, um, I'm the DevOps, and the other guy is released, but also a data scientist. And it's from very different backgrounds. We all just work together the same sort of deal. Yeah. Uh, what's like one of your favorite sprints that you get? Like you mentioned, you have a certain amount of sprints of actual work, and then you get the one sprint to do kind of full projects. What's what's something cool that you do in the past? That you uh, I worked on a project to uh, basically create my own uh, SDK. So it was taking an API and wrapping that API uh, in its own Python based uh, background and using like, what's that technology? Uh, can't think of the name of it right now. So it was like, we, we basically took the calls and made them executable in Python so that instead of you having to go into an API call, you can write a program, that program would just like ask for certain prompts and send that information where you want it to be. And we did that for an entire platform and they're gonna potentially take that information and they're gonna like incorporate it into their production product. Nice. Did it have an interface or was it just the So it's one of those things where the interface is good, but if you try to do automation, you don't wanna be clicking a lot. You wanna be able to just Set, like have a promise preset or have a data preset or like a manifest preset that would just take your manifest items and then execute the things you want to do. So create new whatever the thing this creates. <laughs> and that was super fun because I've never had to do that before. You guys have any other questions for me? Yeah. Sure. Uh, kind of on the topic of APIs, like what was the was the first framework you worked with, um, uh, Python framework that you made to, or you used to create an API? Oh, like, just the, in general. the easiest one would be Bodo, and understanding how like Bodo 3 works, which is the AWS Python based SDK, and modifying and adding more functionality to that in order to create Python modules for Ansible, or like editing it to do calls in Terraform, or do calls in uh, Kubernetes. Cool. Yeah. Like Nike gives you free merchandise, like free shoes or something. Uh, they do not. Depending on like, so if you're in the tech side of it, you generally. What's the question? Sorry. Could does Nike give you free stuff? Oh, is yeah. the question. <laughs> what discount do you get? A decent <laughs> one. <laughs> it's it's a it's a great job, and I mean they're very or they're starting to become. Uh, very engineer first, and they, for the longest time, didn't see themselves as a tech company, and they're working on realizing that it's not just like tech weird, it's like we have to actually work on 
updating and making sure systems are the best they possibly can be. And that is a company line. <laughs> well, Any other questions, guys? <laughs> you know, sorry. If I wasn't working in there, uh, I'd probably try to find something like downtown that does kind of the same vibe. Like, I mean, Akamai, like I mentioned before, is really great. New Relic has a lot of like DevOps and SRE jobs I saw. And I like where the product is, and I've used that product. So one of the cool and weird problems about working for a company as large as the one I do is that they have their fingers in almost every pie because that's just the way it exists. Like we have all these different companies that are around town that like contribute to us. So you understand how like a new technology would work because you kind of have to in order to like deal with the information that one team uses and you want to take that and use it on your own team. And that's probably the most, like, I'm not sure what I can or can't say in that regard, but it's the idea that you always kind of have to learn something new if you want to do things. You can stay the same and probably have job security for a while, but if you want to be better at your job and move on to the next thing, you have to be dynamic and learn as fast as you possibly can. And your question. Oh, it's going to be like when you're working with developers, yeah. um, you know, to, and you know, we, we each have our silo that we're in, so you're the DevOps developers in their world. Yeah. And you want to say to them, hey, if you just did this, it would make it easier. Do you give suggestions like that? It's, does, does that make sense? It absolutely makes sense, and I do not give suggestions like that. I have a manager for that. Okay. So whenever that comes up, I'm going, hey, man. Uh, I'm having a little conflict point here, and I don't want to escalate to the point where I'm telling one person I do their job because I'm not their manager. And if I go and like, hey, if you change the way you're orchestrated this and you built a better platform that did not suck, you would have less bugs. I can't say that. <laughs> I can tell someone else to do that, though, which is what my So there's really was. no good process for, you know, because I really didn't want to make it as a question of conflict, mm -hmm. but more of, Hey, if you know, I do all this research. I do all this googling. This is what I found, you know, technology-wise. Or you know, if we redid things, you know, not specifically point at that person and go, "You're really bad." <laughs> you know, instead say, "Hey, if we thought about this in a different way, yeah. and, and we broke down you know, to, to make smaller containers." Oh, cool. So, perfect example: making smaller containers, right? So, uh, you guys familiar with Docker at all? It's container orchestration. It is like the biggest one to know right now. Uh, if if you if you're building constantly large scale containers over and over again, you're taking up so much space and just building a very large one. But if you were to break it down into chunks of execute, like executable code, like okay, this one does like this provisioning layer. This one does the execution layer. This one does like the testing layer, and you have like your Docker file iterate over that. Like that is something that you would be great to like incorporate almost anywhere. And some teams that I've worked with didn't have that before. And I'd show a demo and I'd be like, hey, look at how this works. What do you think about it? And they would take it or leave it. And that's the So only that's the way to interact with like the developers as opposed to just going to your manager and going, hey, can you Yeah, can you but the way we go is like so tell my manager and the manager would set up time on someone's uh, like on their manager's schedule. And be like, hey, can we go ahead and like give a presentation on like a new thing we're trying to do? We think it'd be cool if you test it out. If you mind sending like you know one of your leads or just like one of your developers come by, we sit down in your room, you pitch the idea to show them how it looks. Uh, you give them metrics and a lot of shiny graphs, and that's you hope they take it. Yeah. Would you recommend like learning Docker to get into DevOps? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so. Containerization is pretty much the same thing as cloud orchestration, right? Because if you think about it, a, a cloud network is someone else's computer, right? A container is someone else's computer, theoretically, but inside your own computer. And you can put that anywhere. So if you, it's the same concept on a smaller scale that you can work on on your own and you know, make different uh, containers inside of your computer that do different things that can connect to each other and, and talk to each other and have like microservices built inside there. So knowing that is a good streamlined way of going further into, into DevOps. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, do 
you worry like you get a vacation time, right? But do you worry like if you take a vacation so two weeks maybe that, that you're gonna get a call from someone about so something that's gonna like disrupt your vacation? So within the first six months of working I would have panic attacks. I would literally be like, okay, I must have messed up if I I have to constantly be checking my phone and checking Slack and checking like my emails to make sure that that whatever I pushed today or whatever I worked on didn't cause some critical failure. Luckily, you never touched production code and like not direct consumer because like every Saturday almost Nike releases like two or three new shoes and we get, you know, 30 million people trying to buy for X amount of shoes that there is definitely no way that demand is possible. All trying to get in at seven o'clock on Saturday morning. And if I built something that like affected the network, it's just like a constant moment of panic for me. But now I've been like, my manager fixes it. Uh, I get paid to do a job. I do that job well, and I should be okay and comfortable in that fact. And that's you, the best you don't can. worry about it. Not as much as I used to. That's <laughs> <laughs> you worry about like once you come back from vacation after two weeks that like the environment's gonna be so different because of how fast stuff moves that you it's gonna take you a whole nother week just to like get back into like your world. So generally speaking, if it, if that happens and your computer's moving that fast, I feel like that's not a healthy space. Like you can't continuously be building that quickly, like if within two weeks of your constantly changing how everything's done. It's, a, it's not sustainable because your engineers are all gonna burn out and they will hate the position they've started for. And B, you will eventually forget and make so many mistakes because you're not having anything last long enough for it to be useful. So at current, like the team that I'm on that doesn't, that doesn't happen, but that's not to say it doesn't happen on the team, especially like you're in app development, right? So that is a bigger one where you're constantly having to do updates, you're constantly having to do changes, and you're constantly having to manage that, that is not my job. So I like, I feel a little confident about what I'm doing, so if two weeks were to go by and I came back and something was new, I feel like I could pick it up fairly quickly, but that generally does not happen, and I don't think it would. Hey. Oh, uh, are you interested in moving up to the manager role? Uh, in theory, uh, yeah. Just reach that new level of stress when we start that one. Yeah, but then you don't you don't write as much code anymore, and that's what I find fun right now is solving problems and learning new things. And without that, I'd just be working behind any other desk anywhere, doing the same thing I did before I started doing tech. How long do you feel about being mentioned thirty days so a lot of it, there's a lot of test data management stuff, so you have to understand, like, if you're going to create a, uh, a pipeline or a structure and you want to be able to test how that works, you want to have someone who will be able to create, you know, users or create, like, a, a, a way for the data to move from one point to the, to the next, you know, without it being... Uh, <coughs> without it like breaking any laws and having actual user information or it being in production or any of that. So that person's job was to maintain the data and make sure that it's reliable, but also usable. Any other questions? Sure. Yeah, just, uh, I got no problem. We can... <laughs> going, going back to that yeah. example that you were talking about with the uh, a new shoe release mm -hmm. and 30 million people hitting website all at once. So um, you know about this ahead of time. So what are you doing as a DevOps person to prepare for that amount of inundation on the website to that particular so, image? So that, that's like a core concept of like DevOps, right? It's understanding how to balance load and how to do that appropriately and knowing what to change in your environment in order to adapt for those changes, you know, things of that nature. Uh, without telling you exactly what, how, you know, uh, the burger gets made here. It's it's like a set list of things that you need to do in order to be able to tolerate that amount of load coming in. And you know, like one of the concepts of uh, operations is understanding load balancing, and that is where that would be very important. Because <coughs> load balancing is being able to take uh, amount of, like a certain amount of data or a certain amount of uh, users coming into a certain point 
and how to mitigate the stress so it doesn't crash one portion of any website or any program or any app, right? So if you're doing an iOS app and you're creating something along those lines and you want to be able to like have multiple people be able to access the exact same data backend, how do you manage that load, right? It's a big thing that a lot of companies are challenged with and it's constantly like learning and adapting and learning new ways to do that, but it is one of the concepts of what makes DevOps DevOps. So like what you're describing then, is let's say there's two people standing next to each other and they're both wanting to pair shoes and they're both going to the same location on the website. One person might end up having a bad experience in a crash and the other person's totally in, you know, in queuing their order. Yep. And that's because of the load balancing and the person, the one person had a bad, you know, hit a bad server or they got overwhelmed. So if they refresh, they then be okay because that, that down. I mean, yeah, sort of. That's a very simplified version of it, but yeah, it's kind of the same concept of like, uh, so like, how do you ensure that, like, you know, DNS routing and understanding how a website works and like getting, it's like you hit Google, right? Like, everyone hits Google, hits the search engine, like, it gets used, um, you know, billions of times a day. How do you make sure that we all end up at the same Google.com and we don't all crash it, right? It's just being able to mitigate where that information goes and how your data is taken from the front end, which would be like, you know, the loading page, how that's passed to different, you know, uh, VMs or servers, different load balancers or, or load balancing to in order to allow that mitigation. And that is like one of the core concepts of why you need ops and why you need to understand how networks work and why you need to understand how that level of orchestration exists in different environments. But like Caching comes into the Yeah, caching, caching would be an easy one, but I mean, that's pretty early, ca depending on what you mean by caching, right? So it's either like caching in the browser or caching on the back end or having a different like data system on the back end to like trap that data and be able to be like, okay, so I know you're, you passed these seven or eight checkpoints that I wanted you to be in. How do I hold your information and keep it so one that you can pass on to the next person that I don't knock you off because someone else just did the same thing a little bit faster, right? It's there's a lot of different things to think about when that comes down to. There's no easy answer for that question, but it is one of the core tenets of why you need someone who de like you need a DevOps engineer. You need someone who not just writes code but understands how the operation side of it works, or how the like an SRE like the, how the site reliability is and how that can stay up and how instead of it doesn't crash. Yeah. Okay. So, so a lot of what you're a lot of what you do is like cross compatibility between platforms, right? A, a, yeah, big chunk of it, right? So it's, how do you, I mean, a lot of the places you work, we don't necessarily own all of them, so you have to be able to take that data and move things around where we need to be, and being able to speak different environments really well. But do, do the different, like, do Azure and AWS, do they make it easy to kind of mesh together, or? So not in and of themselves, you'd have to find another program to help orchestrate that, right? So you need a, orchestrator like Ansible or you need a different language that would be able to run those commands. So I mean, yeah, but once again, that's one of like the core concepts of like what DevOps is. It's the idea that how do I take my data from let's say like a, a vSphere, vBox environment and move it to like a different like uh, environment, right? So how do you take your, how do you make that system continuous? Do you, do you think as the cloud platforms evolve more into the future, there'll be more, you won't need like a third party program to do that job? That's a, it's a good question and I mean, that's pretty theoretical. So it's the idea that uh, why would they want to, but at the same time it would make things better for them individually, right? So I can't really speak to what they're, why they'd want to do it because like, AWS is pretty much going to rule the world someday, right? Like. Uh, uh, Steve, it's like, I got a lot of feelings about AWS, right? But it's prolific, it's almost everywhere, and they don't need to work with a lot of other smaller companies. But if you're one of those small companies who uses, let's say, Azure, right? I mean, granted, a lot of companies use it, but let's say you're a smaller company that has like some stuff on Azure, some stuff on AWS. And it wouldn't be AWS's biggest like job to make sure that you keep using Azure. They want you to use them entirely and get you to mag migrate your data off of that. 
and they're, they're probably not going to make it easier for you to do so unless you pay them a lot of money but but i mean obviously you're using azure in different countries where it's more effective because you use it in that country, so. I mean, they they've got to I don't, I don't know you're probably right there. yeah it's more of like yeah that's worth a good question than that I don't really know the answer for it. The best I can tell you is I hope they do. And mm -hmm. same as my hope they don't, because if they don't, then I'm still useful. Right. <laughs> you guys have any other questions? Sure. Yeah. So uh, as someone who came out of the programming boot camp, um, looking back, what are some skills that you wish you had to know while you were there, or some opportunities that you wish you had? Oh, cool. I did everything wrong in my boot camp. <laughs> like absolutely did everything wrong. I did not network. I barely went out and like found someone who I could talk to. I lucked into a lot of it and failed forward, right? Like I failed often, I failed fast, but always forward. And that's just kind of how I got to here. Like if I were you, I'd definitely focus on making sure I did way more than my curriculum asked for because otherwise you will just be at like the bare minimum and you won't be able to, you won't know it intensively. Cause like there is no way any code program is gonna teach you enough for you to be fluent and adaptable to work in any environment, right? Because they're just trying to give you a baseline. And if you just work on that and don't expand your network and meet other people, who's gonna give me these jobs they've been talking about, right? It's just, so it's that kind of thing you have to do some of that work. I did it. Luckily, I'm very charismatic. Yeah, that's just what I think of myself. And I've met the right people at some of the right times. I lucked enough to be able to be like, oh, hey, I work for the staffing agency. I'm like, oh, I have a background in this. Can we, like, what do you have open? I have nothing right now. Send me an email every couple of weeks being like, so I've been doing this and this. It's what I'm up to you. And then from that point, lucked into a position. You created your life. Yeah. yeah, that's sort of it. Like. And I think that's the thing. I, if I had to go back and do it again and do boot camp again, I would definitely focus more on that and be like focusing on make scaling my skills around the job that I want versus like the idea of what I want. Right. So a lot of uh, another thing is a lot of job descriptions are way more complicated than they have to be. Like aggressively so. No one has like twenty years of experience, a bachelor's degree in computer science and like knows like AWS and JavaScript and Java and all these different things. But being able to adapt and learn and keep that skill going is really what any good hiring manager is going to want from you. And that's where you, that's where you take the coding programs because they try and get you to be like, okay, knowing this what you know in JavaScript or knowing this what you know in Python, how can you extrapolate that to Java? And creating a program that you did in let's say JavaScript in Python or something you did in Python in JavaScript or something you did there in Haskell or something you did there. How about you build your own backend on AWS because it's free. Sign up for like a, a program there, and then like have your like your backend database exist in the cloud so you can access it and create you know just that kind of thing. And those are the things I did not do, but I would definitely recommend you doing. Yeah, but you figured out you needed to. Do. Yeah, absolutely figured out you needed to do it. Kind of push. I'm trying to slot in somewhere like trying to keep my Python skills up and I seem to stumble on a lot of data science-y things. I'm wondering if that's like good practice. I mean, are people Absolutely. Are like what kinds of things, you know, are, are more towards maybe DevOps Python versus like, I need to analyze this large data set and spit out an answer. Like, okay. Like uh, they're sort of different purposes, you know. So that's not necessarily true. The one thing that's beautiful about Python and the language, the fact that it's fairly dynamic, right? You can't host things uh, that you would in JavaScript, or you can do things that were just entirely backend. And that's the reason why I chose that language to begin with. With uh, data science, data science is the future, man. Like we've been, there's so much, everyone's giving away their data for free. Like their name, their information constantly being given out there and mining that information and using that for good or not. I mean, just like being able to use that and manipulate it well, is the next step. It's predictive analysis, which will be like the future of what you sort of want to do. And that is sort of DevOps, right? Because you're going to take the same sort of learning algorithm of, let's say, a server goes down, right? You Let's say you have 3,000 servers, right? And every so often, this happens to like a batch of them. You don't know how that happens. 
you would take that data, you would pop that into your, because you, you're building a continuous pipeline, right? So you want to see, okay, this is happening every so often at this time based on something you don't realize. And you would look at your data, you take the, like a data science algorithm, run it over it, find out when it's happening, find out what are the events associated with it, and be able to fix it that way. And that's why data science is super useful. Like forensics, you know, you're... Yeah, it really is. I mean, all programming, as far as I'm concerned, is forensics, right? Because unless you're pioneering something, which is generally not a thing, you're basically trying to fix a problem that someone creates or someone else did and trying to back your way into making sure that like it never happens again. It, it sounds like the, what you really like about your job is just like learning new things, always having like a fresh genre of information. Yeah. It, I find it hard to believe that in microbiology there wasn't like a lot of new research that came out. I was doing diagnostics, so it was just basically Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I was doing diagnostics, basically doing the same test over and over, and just constantly, you bring in like a blood sample, I'd run that blood sample, I'd throw it on a plate, and do the same thing over and over with no change or understanding of why I was doing it. I mean, I understood what I was doing, but it wasn't like immediate, right? So it wasn't like, oh, I fixed that, and that's no longer a problem ever. And if it does happen again, I know exactly how to fix that problem, right? And I can build like, around that problem so if it happens again, it's mitigated. And that's the reason why I like my job. Cool. So do you think that's necessary, the way that they do, do it like that? In, mm -hmm. like, in microbiology, do you think the way that you're doing your job was like the, the way that they had you do your job, do you think that was the best way to do it? Honestly, probably not. I mean, there it, there's ways to, to streamline that process that I think would be great, but generally that isn't the way it's done. The beauty of code is that it's, it's the idea of innovation is for a lot of companies a, uh, a tenant. Right? They constantly want to be better. They want to be the best. They want to create and never have problems again because problems cost money and everyone wants to make money. Anyone have any questions? Oh, this is okay. so, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say your, your uh, day or week, you know, how much of it is actual programming? Problem solving, meetings, dealing with you know, just the, the things that you like to do and don't like to do. Uh, so, <laughs> I, so, yeah, this is going to sound ridiculous, but uh, the team that I work on, I generally don't work on Fridays and we don't have meetings on Wednesdays, and I get to code whenever I really want to, and I can be like, hey, I'm not going to go to this meeting, and someone else will go for me. And a lot of that is just because of uh, the team that I'm on. That's why I'm happy with the job that I have, but that's not widespread for every company. You know, some places are like meetings every day. You have to write a white paper to even get to figure out how you create a new environment. And when you're in a smaller company, that's a thing because you don't have as much money to throw around and it makes sense. But a larger company with a corporate job is just like blank check. I uh, don't care what happens. We'll just figure out when we run out. So. So you try to spend most of your day in program. I try to, as much as I possibly can. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Uh, so uh, as far as like Python, do you have any recommendations for projects to try to create at the close to the junior level or entry level? Oh, yeah. Uh, you can think of a bunch of stuff if you guys want. Like, OK, we all live in Portland. Rent, rent, rent's going up. How do you? find out what the cheapest rent is, right? Something like that in Python. How do you optimize the bus system? Like, where do you, that data is free. There's an endpoint, there's a database where you look at there. You can create that information, wrap it around something. Have Python to either scrape the website directly or take the backend database and feed it into your program, take that information, either graphically present it or in a data science way, use something with that information. I'm not you know, sure what to do with it, but that's possible, right? And building something like that is kind of like one of those projects that you'd be like, because a lot of companies now, when they go for interviews, that's one of the big things they're going to ask you for is your Git repo and show us something that you've done. And they'll ask you what you've created that you're really proud of and like what's one thing that you've done that you feel like you really learned something new on. And those are ways you do that. Just take a, take a language you like, figure out a problem in your life that you want to make better, and go from there. Like I had a friend who uh, was in Northwest Natural, is the power company, right? He, scrapes their website because it gives them data about how much energy he's using and creating 
and he created an algorithm that like sends an alert to his phone to let him know that he's using too much electricity that day and to turn his power off for a couple of hours so he doesn't pay that much in like electricity. Nice. Right? But that's something he taught and like did in Python just because just for the hell of it. Put it on uh, his GitHub repo and that's something that someone looked at and was like, wow, that's novel and that's something we can expand upon because it's widespread. So you can just there's so much data out there. Use it. So what you're suggesting then is find something that has data, either through an API or when you're saying scrape the website. Um, Same concept. So uh, scraping the website would be on the website you have the data that's not an API format that you can't hit the endpoint for, but you can load the full page. Get the like random parse it. Yeah, parse it. Yeah. Okay. And then take that and then create the data from there. Take the data, manipulate it, present it. Yeah. And so that's basically take those three concepts. And yeah, because that is a big talk part. About it in your career. <laughs> yeah, that's a good. I mean, that's a good intro of one. Instead of being like, I created a website about my dog and a journal, and here's a calc like at the bottom. Like you know, what I mean, it's. But it's the same. It's the same thing. But everyone's going to see those same ones over and over again. Do something you're passionate about. Take the things that you want to learn and the, like a problem that exists in your life. Modify that and then go to the go to the next step. Right. Cool. Well, yeah, because then you, yeah, that's it, right? You'll want to learn more about the things you're trying to build. Well, what's like the most peculiar or like quirky API data set that you've encountered? Well, there's, there's so many. <laughs> there's, so a lot of things that happen with large companies is that they build their front end first and they make that really, really great, right? But they don't build an API, and then they like sort of build an API in the back end in order to make three or four clients happy, and they don't fully create the schema appropriately. So you try and figure out like, hey, if I like query this back end, how do I get this data? And it doesn't exist because it's just not well formatted. And that's one of like the most common things that runs it. Like I run into a lot. And the only way to fix that is like maybe reach out to the company or rebuild it yourself. But who has time? Oh, that's not really what my question was. Okay, but yeah, that's that, was, that was interesting to figure out. So you that. Oh, you guys have for a specific uh, API like, I didn't like, or like, what's that API that Aaron was talking about? Um, last year. Or he had this API for like New York, like utilities complaints where people would be like, oh, there's rats in my apartment, and you know, he would create the database for each like category of like. Complaints that people are working with. So, an API is basically um, just this data that exists somewhere that isn't yours that you can just query to get that right. Like, that's fully what an API is. It's just a uh, URL based endpoint that you can hit with a query on it to get what you want uh, just on its own, right? Like, in the, like, that's the rough equivalent of what it is, right? No, no, I understand that, but I was asking is there any like weird data set for the API that, like, like for like New York, it's like it's kind of a weird data set. Oh yeah, I did. All these like like a, for a fun project, I did one with California and trying to figure out uh, based upon locations in California and the amount of crime calls whether or not they would vote on like a, a measure that I found. It was just like something I looked into because I was bored. It was three a.m. in the morning and I took that API. Most of it was useless because they also dumped a lot of their calls into just a text file. So I had to create a text scraper with a regex to like parse through it and look for only the select phrases I wanted, and then copy the body of data around that, and then take that information and parse it into something else. But that's just like a thing that you would learn to want to do and build from. But did you learn anything from? So you didn't learn anything. From I learned a lot from that. I learned you can never trust data because some if it's, unless you wrote it yourself, it's probably flawed. Uh, it's not always perfectly formatted, and that makes it very difficult to expect that it to operate the exact same way. That's why data science is such a big field. And that is not my focus, but it's something that I'm very interested in, and it's something I like a lot. Cool. All right, thanks, Keeper. Yeah, man. Yeah. I appreciate that. All right, uh, really quick, Pig Squad, this weekend, I'm going tomorrow to the gameplay testing. Um, they've had a couple of game jams recently, so if any of you guys want to come with me, let's link up. Um, thank you, Keeper. Yeah, uh, if any of you guys want to connect with me on LinkedIn, you find me on there. Uh, 
that's probably the easiest way if you don't have any questions or reach out to about anything. I uh, mostly answer them unless you say, hey, I'm a recruiter in the thing. <laughs> Generally not a good look for me, but yeah. <laughs> That's like, so that's the most annoying part about working for a large, the company that I do is that a lot of it I get people just sending me emails like, and all they do is they just uh, scrape my data from LinkedIn. It was like, hey, it says Nike and Senior in here. We know <laughs> nothing else. We're gonna send you like a form letter that we send to everyone as you begin to, like your bid request, and I don't answer those. So, yeah, I like my job, all right? <laughs> but yeah, feel free to reach out if you like. All right, awesome. thank you. If there's any pizza to grab slides before we go, we have some surveys I'm going to put out. If you want to see something specific in the future, please let us know on the surveys. Um, happy you guys came and have a great weekend. Thank you. I'm Rick, by the way. Hey, Kiefer. Nice meeting. Thanks for meeting. Yeah, no worries, man. Thank you. Yeah, much. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for the time. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem at all.